right, good evening and welcome to the New Haven Museum. My name is Cynthia Riccio and I am the Director of Programs and Planning here at the Museum. I just wanted to let you know that this event is part of what we call New Haven 250, an ongoing series of programming developed by the New Haven Museum to complement America 250, culminating with the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence the series will highlight inclusive, local, and lesser-known stories connecting past and present. Tonight's program, based on her book, Pressing Onward, The Imperative Resilience of Latin and Migrant Mothers, by New Haven family physician and anthropologist Jessica P. Sardinia, is the story of women migrants and their shared experience of encountering racism, economic oppression, and sexism, and yet summoned the cognitive and social strategies to build futures for their families. Sardinia notes that while the decision to migrate from Latin America is fraught with danger, destabilization, and isolation, for many, the advantages of life in the U.S. outweigh the struggle. Sardinia's lecture will focus on the stories of mothers who migrated from Latin America to New Haven and overcame trauma and ongoing adversity to build futures for their children. These migrant mothers enact what Sardinia calls imperative resilience, engaging cognitive and social strategies to resist racial, economic, and gender-based oppression to press onward. It is, the, it is a story that will likely resonate with many women who themselves or whose ancestors immigrated to the U.S. Sardinia received her MD and PhD in medical anthropology from Yale University. As a medical anthropologist and family physician, she is committed to using scholarship and activism as tools for health justice. As a clinician, she examines the impacts of race-based medicine on minoritized patients and co-coined the term race-conscious medicine to emphasize the role of racism rather than race in determining illness and health. Her aim is to address health outcomes for marginalized populations at the intersection of research, community-oriented primary care, and health policy. Welcome, Jessica. Here, and it's actually a little bit of a homecoming for me because a lot of the book research and the archival basis of it was conducted here. And that happened as I realized that there was no cohesive narrative of the story of Latin American migrants here in New Haven. And as I kind of tried to piece together patchwork here, a story there, a narrative from somewhere, somewhere else, I realized that I needed to kind of bring together all of that into some some tapestry that can be told um, and to kind of give context to the experience of the women I was speaking to. And I'm really grateful to have benefited from the resources here at the Whitney Library and from the staff here at the museum. So it is really a full circle moment to be able to share this work with you now that it's at its completion. So over there, our time together, I'm hoping to speak with you about what I learned from hearing the stories of immigrant women who migrated from Latin America to build futures for themselves and their families while seeking to protect their own health and the livelihoods of their families amid the early COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to highlight for you the shared and exceptional features of this migration pattern, the ways that women engage these powerful coping strategies to press onward, or as they would say, seguir adelante, enacting what I call imperative resilience as a necessary form of resistance to the multiple forms of economic, gender-based, and legal oppression they encounter. And I also point to policy solutions that can foster a more nurturing environment for migrant communities and for all of us so that we can each achieve our full potential. Miss, I'm very sorry. Lydia halted, her voice lacking the easy confidence of our earlier conversation. I'm worried that my details could be exposed, and the truth is very concerning, above all for the safety of my family. I reassured Lydia that her information would remain confidential and that she was welcome to share no more than she felt comfortable doing. In Honduras, my husband was a doctor. 
He worked for the Ministry of Health and for the Attorney General's office. He was the coroner in the area where we lived. Vivian began tentatively. What happened is that about a year ago, my husband began receiving anonymous letters at the door. After a couple of months, my husband moved us to a town about 20 or 30 minutes away, saying so he could be closer to my work. But we were only there about a month when he tells me, look, my assignment has been changed and we need to move to the city. The city was about six or seven hours away, and I asked myself, how could it be that we just unpacked the last box from our move a few days ago and now we have to move again? My husband said that it was due to his job. So we moved and found a new school for my son, and after about four or five months, I noticed my husband acting more strangely. He never said anything to me, but I could tell, and I would ask him about it, and he would never say anything. Until one morning, before going into work, he woke me up and said, look, I need to talk to you. That morning, he had found my car with the entire passenger side beaten in, and he had found a note that said, as much as you want to hide, we know where you are, and we know where your wife and son are. The police said they were going to protect us, but it never happened. No one was outside the house. No one knocked on our door to say, we're here in case of any suspicious activity. I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing. We had a tourist visa for the U.S. that we received for years prior by the grace of God. We had no choice but to leave. We took one suitcase each. I didn't even say goodbye to my parents. Lydia and her family stayed with a relative for a few months while they settled in New Haven. Her husband took a job in landscaping to support them. In Honduras, my husband was a professional, a doctor. And now what does he do? He had to learn to use tools. The changes in his body, in his face, in his hands have been... Lydia's voice trailed off. He comes home and plays with my son, and my son says, Daddy, your hands hurt me. And my husband says, well, yes, look, my hands are hurt. And my son tells him, yes, but don't touch me with your hands. You're hurting me. Vivi's family had applied for political asylum. But according to their lawyer, their case was complicated because they had overstayed their tourist visas. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, their case had not yet been processed by the time we spoke. We move around with the greatest caution, Vivi said, because we're already here, illegal, you know? Lydia's story exposes the impact of socio-political violence in Latin America. Although some migrants leave their home countries voluntarily out of a sense of adventure or to seek better opportunities, migration often results from the failure of the state to protect its citizens. In these cases, migration may be a life or death decision. State failure and violence in Latin America compel hundreds of thousands to flee each year. Latin American history is pierced by violence. From colonization, African enslavement, and indigenous genocide in the 15th or 18th centuries, to political conflicts and brutal dictatorships amid state modernization in the 19th and 20th centuries, and social strife arising from state destabilization in the contemporary period, each era of Latin American history features acts of inhumanity perpetrated by dominant social and political groups against subordinate ones. While this history of violence affects individuals and communities through historic and transgenerational trauma, it is the current sociopolitical upheaval, including assaults and homicides, as well as weak social safety nets, that most directly informs decisions to migrate. This new violence reflects social disruption and the, way, the ways that gestures toward democratization have failed to meet the needs of citizens. Contemporary violence in Latin America erupts from a confluence of factors, including social inequality, poverty, drug trafficking, and judicial weaknesses and corruption. This violence reinforces existing social orders, maintaining the elevated status of wealthy landowning men. Although many consider state failure to be defined by civil war and disintegration of state institutions, in Latin America it is characterized by post-authoritarian, not only democratic, but dysfunctional state institutions that citizens do not consider legitimate. Systemic flaws in the region include unreliable electoral politics, lack of fundamental accountability, economic inequality, and social exclusion, which in turn lead to violence. State failure undermines 
citizenship and the foundations of democracy through its inability to uphold the rule of law and protect citizens. When the state loses its grip on the legitimate use of force, drug lords, violent political entrepreneurs, and gangs of disenfranchised youth rule supreme. This failure breeds fear, violence, and distrust, shattering the social fabric and affecting citizens' physical and mental health. Social inequality and criminal violence in Latin America have been fomented by U.S. interventionism, particularly economic, political, and militaristic incursions. U.S. promotion of neoliberal economic policies, including free trade agreements like NAFTA and the southward expansion of the war on drugs, have resulted in displacement and dispossession as well as dangerous practices of drug trafficking. Drug enforcement and border control policies have created potential for multi-billion dollar enterprises for smuggling drugs, weapons, and people. The lucrative nature of these enterprises contributes to political and judicial corruption. The impunity of the powerful and the insecurity it engenders in the less powerful keeps women like the media in the United States, despite immense challenges. Livia detailed the pain of thrusting her four-year-old son into a strange country. It's so stressful for him to speak English. He asks me, but mommy, why can't I speak English? And to everyone on the street or at Walmart or at the grocery store or the laundromat, he asks, do you speak Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? He wants to play and interact with others, but he can't. It's so difficult. The decision to migrate is fraught with danger, destabilization, and isolation. Yet the advantages to life in the United States outweigh the struggles of migration and resettlement. In short, state failure not only drives transnational migration, but it also sustains it. A state's inability or deliberate failure to provide adequate protection and assistance, as well as full citizenship rights to all, undermines peace and stability. The production and maintenance of an underclass in Latin America stripped of civic entitlements spawns a new underclass of, quote, illegals in the United States who serve as a cheap and exploitable labor force. But the process of migration itself inflicts its own harms, which I'll illustrate through the story of Garida. We were three or four women and 13 men in the group, Garida said. 34 year old forbidden. If we had to run, we women knew we'd be left behind. Garibald spent three months traveling from Peru to the Mexican border. She had to pay off multiple soldiers and border guards to arrive safely. They gave us a backpack with water, some fruit, and some canned food. The water was so heavy, I didn't want to carry it. And the canned food was awful. It weighed so much, didn't give much energy, and made us sick. Two of the women became very ill, vomiting everything they took in, and they had to turn back. On the second or third day, I couldn't carry it all anymore, and I left almost everything behind. Another Peruvian man in the group helped me carry my gallon of water, but despite that, I became very dizzy. The man took out some oranges and pressed them to my lips. He told me I needed to go to the river to drink some water. I couldn't walk, and so he carried me on his shoulders and brought me water from the river. We had to hide in holes in the ground from the immigration planes overhead. When Border Patrol found us, the man and I managed to hide in some bushes, but they caught the only other woman, the niece of another traveler, and sent her back to Mexico. The uncle crossed back to try to find her again, and it was just 12 men and me. I tried to lead, I thought, if they start running, where will that leave me? After several more weeks of travel, Garidad arrived in New Haven. It's safer here. In Peru, they'll shut out the lights on the bus and steal the necklace right off your neck. It happened to me. Gave me a huge red mark, Garidad explained. Here in New Haven, you can carry your purse to the store without worry. Plus, in the summer, it smells like the ocean. She adds, a smile radiating through her voice. Garidad's story attests to the physical toll of migrating through the desert. She endured dehydration, exposure, and the precarity of being a woman in groups of mostly men. Garibald was lucky. She arrived at her destination safely, without encountering immigration authorities and being detained. 
The less fortunate migrants may make multiple attempts to cross the border after environmental and hazards and immigration authorities force them back. Latin American migrants face dangers such as thievery, kidnapping, extortion, and dehydration. Women are also at greater risk of rape, assault, trafficking, and forced prostitution. After settling in the United States, many of these women experience intimate partner violence as their social positions make them more vulnerable to abuse. Over 75% of Latin American migrant women living in the United States report histories of trauma. Scholars Pereira and Ornelas refer to hammering migration experiences as painful passages. Such traumas, along with the targeting of migrant bodies for disciplinary control under U.S. immigration enforcement, groom them for subservience, docility, and compliance as members of the American underclass. My brother had come here first, Priscilla told me, describing how she had learned about work opportunities from her community in Tlaxcala. Other relatives soon followed. Soon it seemed that Priscilla had a cluster of family members living in New Haven. She began hearing more and more about the city through her family. After earning a degree in mathematics, Priscilla passed her licensing exam and sought employment as a teacher. But she would have needed thousands of dollars more to pay for an internship that would allow her to accumulate enough hours to qualify for a job. Her mother suggested that she move to the United States with her brother to work for a few years, earn the amount she needed for the teaching job, and then return. It made sense at the time, Priscilla told me. There was a group of women that my mother knew who were going to be migrating, so she asked me, do you want to go with them? I figured, well, if I come for a few years, I'll probably have enough money to come back and get this job. But the things you plan don't always work out. That's life. You see the follow the path that was born by many in her community to get a job here in New Haven. The city felt almost familiar to her, given how much she heard about it back home. And then I met my husband, and I stayed. Yusita's experience exemplifies chain migration, a social pattern by which immigrants from one community follow friends and family to a particular destination in the receiving country. Among my interlocutors, Celia and Juana, up with their sisters, who had moved to join their husband's families. Mm -hmm. Asensión had a brother and a nephew and rented a room while she found her feet. Raquel and her husband, who had originally come to New York City as students, moved to New Haven when they met a compatriot from Chile who had offered her husband a job. Each of these women acknowledged how their connections helped them get started in the city. The term chain migration took on a negative political connotation during the Trump administration when the president conveyed against bad hombres and rapists smuggling drugs into the country and bringing along criminal family members. His language evoked images of family mafias or chain gangs, effectively dehumanizing migrants. Although the United States immigration policy has prioritized family reunification, that privilege has often been denied to families of the wrong kind, including poor brown migrants from Latin America. Migrants have persisted in the face of this rejection, forming networks to support one another and holding to the coattails of earlier arrivals as they seek to establish themselves in welcoming destinations like New Haven. New Haven has been a welcoming home for many Latin American migrants. Despite statewide declines in the city of New Haven, Latin American migrant population has continued to grow and now composes 30% of the population. With a 35% increase in Latin American migrants between 2000 and 2010, the group grew to constitute 77.4% of the population. In response to a surge in violence in Central America in 2014, migrants, particularly unaccompanied minors, poured into New Haven, and this pattern has persisted. A lot of the statistics likely underestimate the number of undocumented residents living in New Haven, which has designated itself a sanctuary city and is informally recognized as a safe destination for people seeking to resettle in the United States without or prior to legal processing. On a grassroots level, organizations like Junta for Progressive Action, Unidad Latina Nación, and Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services provide resources and collective bargaining power for undocumented immigrants suffering legal and workplace exploitation. Officially, the New Haven administration also demonstrates a commitment to protecting undocumented immigrants. In January 2017, New Haven Mayor, then New Haven Mayor Tony Harp and U.S. Representative Rosa DeLauro defended the community against federal deportation raids upholding the city's priority to safeguard the well-being of all New Haven residents 
and statements affecting New Haven as a welcoming city have been since reiterated in 2020 and 2022. Community leaders that I interviewed spoke to the power of community organizing to achieve these gains. During all my prior interviews with community leaders, everyone told me that I had to speak with Norma Franceschi. She knew all about the history of migration to New Haven and had supported many migrants in their transitions to the city. Her bodega on Main Street in Bear Haven has served as an informal social services hub when no others existed. So I pulled up to Norma's home, a white branch style house with a neat front yard on a Saturday morning. So I organized my notes and a little bag of pastries I brought, a slim figure appeared in the doorway. Pull over here behind the house, the woman's voice shouted from the door. People drive like madmen on the street. They'll swipe your car. I followed her instructions and gently tapped at the store door. And inside, two small Yorkshire Terriers announced my arrival, yapping loudly at the pails whipping back and forth. In a moment, Norma appeared and ushered me inside. Her hair, once blonde, now almost entirely silver, was pulled into a neat bun. Her shoulders were hunched slightly forward. When we first got here, it was very difficult because nothing was in Spanish. We went to the hospitals, and at the hospitals there were no interpreters, no Hispanics. Norma had migrated to the United States with her husband in 1971, just a few years before a military junta took over Argentina and coup d'etat. Fair Haven was all Italian. There was only one single Spanish business, Norma told me. At the time, most Latinx residents, then predominantly Puerto Rican, lived in the hill in the rural areas surrounding New Haven. Norma added that no Central or South American products were available because at that time, the only Hispanics were Puerto Rican. But the Puerto Ricans did not live in New Haven. The Puerto Ricans lived in Guilford because in Guilford, they harvested tobacco. Puerto Ricans were the first to establish a social and cultural hub in New Haven, building churches, clubs, and community groups dedicated to health and education. But in the late 1980s, the demographics of New Haven began to shift. Now you had an undocumented population, former Mayor John Stefano told me. Unlike the Puerto Rican community, they did not want to play prominent physical roles in the community because of their immigration status. Norma Franceschi recalled the day she realized the dramatic change in the community and its needs. I left my home at 6.25 to open my store at 7 a.m. I got to Apicellas, to the bakery, to pick up fresh bread and go to open the store. And right there in front of me is one of those trucks that you rent, a U-Haul, right? The driver stops, opens the back door, and you can see, boy, how many people go out there? Now standing beside her dining room table, and Norma put a hand to her temper, and fingers displayed through her white blonde hair. And I say to myself, what is this? It looks like someone had stepped in an anthill. And one of my employees, Maria de Jesus, tells me, Norma, those are Mexicans. And they began to run everywhere. These are coyotes that are bringing people, Maria de Jesus said. And so I say, where are they going, Maria? She says, they're renting a room. And they told me that there would be seven or eight people in one room, and that the gringos are taking advantage. They would rent these lofts without bathrooms, so they couldn't relieve themselves or bathe. The needs of the Puerto Rican and Central and South American communities were drastically different. Whereas Puerto Ricans were pursuing higher education and a living wage, the new migrants focused on being basic needs housing, sanitation, and legal status. On May 1st, 2006, May Day, later dubbed a day without immigrants, thousands of migrants abandoned their low-wage jobs to demonstrate the, the value of their contributions to society. Megan Fountain, currently current advocacy coordinator at Unidad Latina Nación, was an undergraduate student at Yale at the time. She recalled, there was this massive mobilization, the biggest protest in New Haven since 1970. I just saw this huge mobilization of immigrants, you know, people who I didn't normally see in New Haven in my day-to-day -day life as a student, and all of a sudden they were right there on the New Haven ring. That same year, New Haven established a policy of non-cooperation with federal immigration authorities. That summer, they introduced plans to create municipal ID cards for undocumented residents, following the activist work of local immigrant rights organizations and the predominantly Latinx par parish, Santa Rosa de Lima. Then, on Wednesday, June 6, 2007, 36 hours after the city's board of officers had approved plans for municipal ID cards, 
Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE agents, swept into the city, starting early in the morning, and arrested 34 people. It was like 5 in the morning, Mama tells me, and Maddie calls me saying, La vida came, and they took everyone. The Fairhaven community immediately began working on guardianship paperwork for children whose parents had been arrested. Next, they began raising funds to bail the migrants out of detention centers in Boston and Rhode Island. And in partnership with the Yale Law School, the community prevented the detainees from deportation. The raid in New Haven figured as part of an act of political theater as, a, as a, an attempt from the Bush administration to appear tough on illegal immigration. Whereas powerful coordination and the backing of Yale Law students prevented the deportation of New Haven migrants, Elsewhere in the country, the raids fractured hundreds of families, separating many children from their parents. In New Haven and beyond, these actions and policies demonstrate how immigration enforcement is a political configuration designed to uphold racist economic regimes that exploit and carceralize brown migrant bodies while denying them any claim to legal security. The racialization of migrant bodies continues as women seek reproductive care. I describe now how the racial power dynamics by which predominantly white providers treat Latina birthers set the stage for harm, as is the case for Sylvia. Last Saturday, the pain started. I went to the hospital, but there was no space for me yet. Sylvia related the beginning of her traumatic birth story with calm resignation. Her older son had been born via C-section, and for her medical records, she had an unknown uterine scar, meaning she did not know, and her obstetricians in Ecuador had not documented where her uterus had been cut. Despite this, Celia consented to a trial of labor after a cesarean, TOLAC, three months prior to her delivery. In the morning when Celia arrived at the hospital, she had already begun bleeding. She told me, I had started bleeding, that's why I went in. I was going to wait until the pain, pains became stronger, but it was already too much. I went in that same day, but they sent me back. They told me that they would call that afternoon to check me in because there was still no bed at the hospital. But it wasn't until Saturday night that they told me to come back. At the time I was hearing the story, I was a medical student, and I knew that bleeding in late pregnancy raises concerns for several complications that clinical guidelines suggest that this coupling of vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain in women with histories of C-sections, particularly during labor, almost always indicate an emergency. But, despite these warning signs, the medical team at the hospital originally turned Sidia away. When she returned to the hospital, Sidia received an infusion of Pitocin, a synthetic form of the hormone oxytocin, to accelerate her labor. They began the induction on Saturday, and from that night through the morning, the pains were very strong. In the morning, they gave me stuff for the pain, so I had a lot of strong medicine in me, but I told them I couldn't take the pain anymore. The next step, they said, was to inject my back, the medicine they give you when you're going to have a C-section. It was only with that medicine that I was able to endure the pain. Then, around four in the afternoon, the baby still was in there, and it wasn't coming. Many hours had passed and I wasn't dilating only. I tried pushing, but now there was no way for him to come down. But by that time it was too late and the pains were so strong that I was like, I can't take it anymore. I don't remember very well, but they were telling my husband that my pain could be because my wound was opening. So they took me to the operating room in about 10 minutes. They gave me full anesthesia and then they realized that it was the wound that had opened, which was why my belly had grown so much. Something was wrong with my uterus. The operation was no longer a normal operation, a normal C-section. They had to reconstruct something and it became much more tedious. Celia suffered a lateral extension of her original uterine incision, or a broad stretching of the scar that tore open her uterus. Not only this, but both of her uterine arteries, the major vessels that supply blood to the uterus, had ripped open. The obstetricians also noted that four centimeters of her uterus had thinned so much that her son could be seen through the tissue. Sidney's red blood cell volume dropped to a dangerously low level. She received two units of transfused blood. Sidney continued, it was almost as if I had a double birth. I was unrecognizable. 
The next day after delivery, it was ugly. My entire body was swollen from head to toe. My blood pressure went up. I got dizzy. It took a lot of blood out of me, and then they had to put blood back into me to be able to recover. Multiple episodes of dizziness and severe fluctuations in blood pressure kept setting it under careful monitoring. The hospital eventually discharged her one week later. Despite these harrowing events, including uterine rupture, postpartum hemorrhage, and postpartum preeclampsia, the attending physician described the C-section as uncomplicated in her discharge summary. The oversimplified label of Celia's C-section as uncomplicated, the medical blunders that occurred during her birth, and her questionable first C-section highlight how obstetric racism takes the dual form of disempowering women through both inadequate care and unwanted intervention. First, Celia was a women-centered patient, a label that is often assigned in, I was told, a derogatory tone. In other words, Sidia came from a safety net clinic and lacked insurance. This, coupled with her inability to speak English fluently, likely contributed to the delay in her admission for labor. Within this care model, as with many other safety net prenatal clinics, patients see a variety of providers for their prenatal care, including midwives, physician assistants, and rarely obstetricians, and then give birth attended by whomever is on call at the time, usually a resident physician who is still in training. Celia had no one who could advocate for her. When she called the hospital describing her early labor pains and bleeding, no dedicated provider could follow up and urge her admission. Even if one of her clinic providers had been on call at the time, none of them spoke Spanish and thereby did not fully appreciate the nuance of her experience. Celia lost precious hours, likely during which her labor and terror worsened. Second, at several points, providers underreacted to Celia's complaints of pain. Celia raised concerns of severe pain Saturday night and received no relief until the following morning. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology states that maternal request is sufficient medical indication for pain relief during labor, yet Celia suffered hours of pain without medication. She initially received an opioid medication, generally disfavored for labor pain given its lower effectiveness relative to an epidural or a spinal analgesia, and elevated risk of fetal heart rate and respiratory depression and neural behavioral changes in the newborn. Eventually, she did receive an epidural and her labor slowed. During these agonizing hours, Celia's suffering was extended. Celia's bleeding, severe pain, Decrease in uterine tone and history prior C section should have raised red flags for uterine rupture. And it's impossible to know how Sylvia tumbled through the course of care she received. But her experience raises concerns for racial biases and perceptions of pain and the facility of childbirth. Patients of color across care settings consistently receive lower quality pain care and are less likely to receive opioids for severe pain. This reality may reflect common racialized beliefs, particularly about black patients, of their possessing thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings. I often heard providers at the clinic speak about how healthy Latin American patients were and how they rarely needed epidural anesthesia. Such efforts are likely well intended. Trends favoring empowered natural births and benchmarks of reducing C-sections at facilities to 15% or below to reduce unnecessary surgeries and complications may encourage providers to recommend against epidurals and C-sections. Still, women of color more commonly report stressful birthing experiences and disregard for their preferences. Third, Celia was engrafted in a system of biomedicine that views women particularly poor women, as pathological, possessors of unruly bodies. In their medical notes, Sidious providers state that she failed to lack and did not labor, characterizing Sidious' body as uncooperative and negating her experience of labor pains that lasted more than 24 hours. The reason for her C-section was listed as the head of the baby was big and it never fit, not regarding the truth of her uterine abruption and concerning clues of abdominal bleeding and prolonged labor. The medical team attributes the emergency surgery to the anatomy of Celia and her baby, rather than to an expected complication of birth following prior C-section. 
In this way, the racial medical hierarchy enforced the sensualist stereotypes of Latino reproduction upon Sayyid's body, characterizing it as unruly and the party at fault for its traumatic outcome. Sayyid's distinctive medical history and presentation were flattened based on her status as a poor Spanish speaking Latina safety net clinic patient. They scaled their assessment, clinicians scaled their assessment of risk to their default for hardy patients, poor men of color, that they imagine desire or deserve fewer medical interventions. These presuppositions of health or implicit minimization of risk for Latina mothers may contribute to harmful and even life-threatening biases in care practice. Finally, providers, both in Ecuador and in the United States, fail to afford Celia respect for autonomy, violating the first principle of biomedical ethics. Celia had birthed her first child via C-section for reasons that were not entirely clear to her. This experience echoed those of many of my interlocutors who reported C-sections in their home countries that were either scheduled early in pregnancy or ordered for unclear reasons, despite their insistence against them. Although some Latin American and Latina pregnant people may opt for C-section, often they are funneled through this medicalized path without full knowledge of the implications or active participation in the process. As such, people like Celia may agree to this massive abdominal surgery without fully understanding whether it was truly medically indicated and how it might affect their future birth plans. As such, over-medicalization, as with denial of necessary medical care increases the risk for adverse reproductive health outcomes and disproportionately harms black and brown birthing people. Such disempowerment constitutes a form of transnational obstetric violence that follows migrants as they journey across borders. And so when Celia consented to her toll back, despite her unknown uterine scar and unclear obstetric history, she didn't have all the details needed to make an informed decision about her birth plan. Her vulnerability can Considering this incomplete clinical picture, should have entitled her to even more cautious communication about her options during her prenatal care and a timely response to her concerns at the time of her labor. Instead, she found herself desperately confused, her requests denied, and clinging to her own life, let alone the life of her newborn. Here, the obstetric racism she encountered endangered and dehumanized Celia. This traumatic birth highlighted her treatment as an undeserving, poor, obstetrically hardy Latina woman, despite the particularities of her medical history, revealing the bipartite structure of obstetric racism that deprives women of agency by denying care when they need it and forcing care upon them when they do not fully really consent. I found myself in awe of these women who, despite racism, immense economic diversity and limited social support seemed astonishingly okay. <laughs> Despite these traumatic histories, and me, I at the time was a young mother who was raising a small child, and I found that really challenging. Despite all of the supports I had, I was in a dual income household, I had help with my animals, and yet these women a lot of the time were doing all this on their own and had everything working against them. And so I, comparing my situation with theirs, was truly humbled, and it prompted me to reflect on conventional understandings of resilience. So, although definitions vary, resilience generally refers to engaging resources in the face of adversity to achieve goals. Unlike concepts of positive psychology and competence, resilience considers social environment as a factor influencing an individual's ability to adapt to different life circumstances. Resilience and its companion concepts, flourishing, emphasize healthy functioning, or at least an absence of psychopathology. They often imply well-being and positive or protective factors that lend themselves to measurement using pre- and post-intervention assessments and behavioral health research. And nearly all scholars of resilience in clinical medicine and public health and related social sciences agree that resilience is a good thing. It's something that should be optimized and they seek to pinpoint the ways that it can be cultivated. The challenge is that this interpretation of resilience fixes the concept as a static characteristic akin to toughness or grit rather than as a process of rational action. 
A more nuanced conceptualization of resilience views it as a trajectory or a process of adaptation or sustained healthy adjustment over time. Interpretations of trauma and marginalization that recognize individual identity and agency within a social, political, and, and cultural circumstances allow consideration of mental health responses that are not uniformly negative. And so when I was working on this project, I had research assistants who were from Yale, many of them identified as a Latino, a Latine, Latinx. Um, and when I talked about this idea of resilience, a lot of them cringed. Um, so those of you who are familiar with the Yale environment, there is La Casa Cultural, which is the Latino Heritage Center at Yale. And um, some of my research assistants were saying, oh, this is the topic that came up at La Casa. And one said, at La Casa, we talk a lot about resilience, like it's something white people think we should have for making it here. But that's not it at all. I mean, we are resilient because we have to be. And the joke was that, you know, the response to, wow, you're so resilient, should be thanks. It was between that and dropping out or dying. Um, so <laughs> the challenge is that theories of resilience um, don't really recognize it, that it is resistance. It is a mode of resistance to oppression. Um, and that's what my internal theories reveal. It is, it is a dynamic process. It's not an ability. It's not a choice. It is a conditioned response to the multiple forms of violence they encounter every day through racism, sexism, immigration enforcement, and economic inequality. And so that is why, in doing this work, I propose the concept of imperative resilience to describe these strategies that women employ cognitively, emotionally, and socially to get by in the face of these overlapping universities. So, what is imperative resilience? What does it look like? What does it sound like? So Priscilla, for example, told me that she could not afford to let her emotional responses interfere with her ability to handle stress. Instead, she focuses on problem solving. Let's say I do not have something that I should, she explained. For example, this month, I didn't have the money I needed to pay the electric bill. I didn't make that bill this month, so next month, I'm going to work more hours to cover it. If I get angry about it, things will just get worse. It won't solve anything, so I just try to calm down and look for solutions to be more economical and more organized. Did you see this people almost puzzled by my questions about how she bounces back from stress or other difficulties in life? She would stop me and say, I try to keep things simple. If I complicate things, it's not going to solve anything at all. If I complicate things, I get home in a bad mood and I take it out on my children. But they are my responsibility. I have to be the responsible one. If I get angry and yell and scream to let off steam, it's all to nothing in the end. Quite the opposite. It makes things worse. I just have to calm down and look for solutions. I have to accept and endure. These themes of acceptance and endurance and the desire to shield children from stress echoed throughout my interviews. Women felt it was their responsibility to minimize their affective responses to difficult circumstances to preserve the emotional and physical health of their children and their pregnancies. So at first glance, these coping strategies might seem as maladaptive um, and be described clinically by psychologists and psychiatrists as emotional numbing and intellectualization, repression, cognitive avoidance. And it's true that avoidance coping is associated with greater life stress and depressive symptoms. But Priscilla also emphasized strategies like problem solving, benefit finding, altruism, and personal spiritual growth. So she might suppress her emotional reactions to stress, but she does so out of concern for her children. And she focuses on practical solutions to her challenges, like adjusting the budget and work hours. We can characterize these strategies for survival and imperative resilience. It's a performance that becomes actualized through practice. The necessity of suppressing negative emotions, emphasizing the positive, and strategic problem solving, it's not inherent not an inherent trait like, trait like grit or toughness. It's not special access to social or material resources because these women largely didn't have that. But it arises as a form of opposition to social injustice, a way of summoning personal and social capacity to fill the voids left by society. And speaking of the voids left by society, the COVID pandemic exposed a lot of those. Women like those in my study were particularly vulnerable to the effects of the COVID pandemic. At the height of the pandemic, 
Many who held low wage essential jobs were not able to work from home and were at risk of exposure to the virus in the workplace. Several lost their jobs, were barred from collecting unemployment relief or the stimulus payments offered through the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act or the CARES Act. As a result, they were compelled to engage in precarious work arrangements. Many lacked the financial resources to stock up on food and household supplies, requiring more frequent trips to stores, which also increased their risk of exposure. In addition, given the lack of healthcare access, undocumented migrants were less likely to receive prompt evaluation of symptoms for COVID or any other disease. And although testing at some point became free, evaluation and treatment were not. And so a lot of those costs deterred low-income undocumented migrants from seeking the necessary care and increased their risk of mortality. I used to work at Amazon scanning products, says Antoinette, a 23-year-old from the Dominican Republic. I liked to work, but it was so long, 11 or 12 hours at a time. I had to quit my job when I caught the coronavirus there. I got up there and I haven't gone back. I'm too afraid, especially now that I'm pregnant. I'm worried something will happen to me again. Antoinette contracted COVID-19 in May 2020 at the Amazon Distribution Warehouse in North Haven, Connecticut. Just one month later, allegations of the company's disregard for employee safety exploded throughout the news media. Warehouse workers criticized Amazon for failure to implement physical distancing protocols, noting that the wearable devices for workers to keep six feet apart were useless because it was impossible. Some employees showed up to work despite COVID-19 concerns or symptoms out of fear of losing their jobs. Many workers stated that they did not receive enough time to properly wash their hands and disinfect workstations, and they attested to delays or non-payment of compensation for quarantine or isolation following exposure or confirmed infection. It was like a week, no, two weeks, I should say. My whole body ached. I couldn't even get out of bed. I had no sense of taste, no sense of smell. I couldn't eat much. Sometimes it felt like I couldn't breathe. I couldn't go to the hospital. I only went to get tested. I was scared. I just went out to get tested and I went home. If it got really bad, they said I could go to the emergency room or I could call them and send an ambulance for me, but I was really scared. Antoinette's fears were twofold. First, she feared that if she had to be admitted to the hospital, her condition would worsen. Her cousin in the Dominican Republic, just 40 years old, had died in a hospital that had exceeded its capacity. They did what they could, she told me, but everything had collapsed because so many people had the coronavirus, and my cousin just died. Antoinette feared a similar fate. Second, she worried that the hospitalization would incur insurmountable debt. Although she had medical coverage now from Husky, after acquiring U.S. residency through her citizen husband, Antoinette had been scarred by the cost of medical treatment when dizzy spells from dehydration and overwork at Amazon had landed in her emergency room. I got a big bill at the end, she tells me. It's still there. I just have to agree to pay it little by little. It just added up. Antoinette's experience, along with those of many male other interlocutors, point to necessary policy reform, reforms. First, we need universal health care for our migrant communities that includes adequate behavioral and mental health services. In Connecticut, legislation has expanded Husky to children, and a proposed bill would extend that to age 26, but many remain uninsured. We can do better. Second, we need provisions for basic needs like food, housing, and diapers, whether for universal basic income or the expansion of services like SNAP and TANF to non-citizens. Third, we need a clear and accessible pathway to lawful migration. Updating the migration registry, which has not been touched in 40 years and has previously received bipartisan support, would adjust the status of an estimated 8 million undocumented residents. Monarch butterflies, with just a 3-4 to four inch wingspan, travel 50 to 100 miles a day during their migration, flapping their wings 5 to 12 times per second. As the days shorten and the temperatures drop in their breeding areas across the United States and Canada, their primary source of food, milkweed, disappears. The butterflies overwinter in the mountains of central Mexico, shielded by Ayala fir trees whose microclimate protects them from extreme temperatures. As the days lengthen and the temperatures rise, however, this climate becomes inhospitable, prompting them to leave their roosting sites. Native female monarchs leave first blazing a trail that the next three to four generations will follow. These long and exhausting migrations are essential to the breeding success of the monarchs. Their resilience 
exists, like that of our interlocutors, is a necessity, a means of survival in a harsh and ever-changing world. I understand the resilience of these Latin American migrant women as a resistance to structural violence. I consider it a form of psychosocial rebellion against oppressive structures. Women summon religious beliefs, self-conceptions of strength, and altruistic concerns for their families to fight against social and economic subjugation, to seguir adelante, or press onward. In this conversation, I have attempted to consolidate the hundreds of hours I had with 65 women, <laughs> three commissions, and 13 community leaders to highlight the global and local forces that constrain women's life opportunities and how they push against those to meet their goals. I want to highlight a few points. First, the disintegration of democratic institutions in Latin America, largely due to unequal trade relations and the war on drugs, which means these governments neither exercise effective control over force nor provide adequate social support, breeds mistrust and fear, and forces women to migrate. Second, migration-related trauma and immigration enforcement grooms migrants to be exploited as part of an American underclass. Third, giving birth as a Latin American migrant mother in the United States is itself a process of racialization. Fourth, and I didn't get to speak about this as much today, but it's an important takeaway point, is that conventional public health and mental health approaches may use symptoms or absence of symptoms as evidence of resilience, but I argue that this is a necessary conditioned response or resistance to the multiple overlapping oppressions of legal violence, racism, and gender-based violence, as well as economic oppression. Fifth, the term I propose to describe this is imperative resilience, and it describes the cognitive, social, and emotional strategies women use to get by in the day-to-day, -day, to seguir adelante or press onward. Finally, no woman should be forced to rely on her own intrinsic abilities to survive and build a life for herself and her family in a hostile environment. She deserves to be supported and to have enough capacity to grow her self-worth and invest in her dreams. Policy reforms like pathways to legal immigration, basic income and housing support, and universal health care can make this a reality. And here I'm including a video that uses the metaphor of a monarch butterfly to articulate the meaning of imperative resilience in the lives of the women I interviewed. See you. When the weather turns and the milkweed wills, monarch butterflies lift their wings and embark on a perilous migration from the United States to Mexico in search of nectar. In the face of deforestation and climate change, they journey for their survival and for the survival of their offspring. Theirs could be a story of suffering, but I see it as one of power and persistence. Like the monarchs, mothers who migrate from Latin America to the United States face extreme obstacles. They craft their futures and the futures of their children despite devastating inequality, harmful politics, and a global pandemic. They too can be seen as sufferers. Instead, I see resistance. I call this imperative resilience a strategic approach to push onward or to give up Imperative resilience sounds like Adelina telling me, whenever something seems stressful, I just don't think about it. I'm just like, there's going to be another day when you can make it better. Or Elvira explaining, you just have to accept it and adapt. Create something nice out of it so you don't have to focus on the bad. It looks like hand-picked partnerships that provide the support mothers need to fulfill their family's goals. It feels like a spark when that moment of prayer or spiritual song carries a message from God. It echoes through the wisdom passed on by mothers and grandmothers 
to help their daughters dream bigger. But just like a cold snap shocks the monarchs, the COVID-19 pandemic devastated my group mothers. These women lost work and shuttered themselves at home to protect their children. They watched loved ones contract the virus and die. As Jacqueline puts it, it was like a trauma. I was afraid of what would happen if I got sick. For three months, I didn't go out at all. We kept hearing about people dying. Women like Jacqueline need the essentials, like food, diapers, and health care. They need protection against domestic violence and a clear pathway to citizenship. Policymakers must build a more nurturing home for these migrant women. In New Haven, Connecticut, a longtime refuge for migrants, children build monarch way stations where the butterflies refuel during their long migration. Like the monarchs, we do not have to force migrant women to suffer or starve. We can work together to create a more nourishing and equitable home for our neighbors. And I, you know, bit my lip and I decided that 
they needed to hear that. And um, that was part of my agreement with the clinic when I decided that I was going to work there. And I asked, you know, what do you want from this research? And one of the things that they said was they wanted to be able to provide better trauma-informed care. And trauma-informed care is a very nebulous term um, that really intended to recognize that people come from different backgrounds and experiences and trying to meet people where they are. And I felt that the best way that I could serve by meeting their goal of the research was to tell them what they were telling me about their experiences. So having the clinic know that um, women felt sometimes that they were viewed as stupid for not understanding English, that um, a lot of times when providers were working with an interpreter, they would be talking to the phone and not to the patient, or would be talking about the patient to the interpreter instead of talking to the patient and having the interpreter as a resource, um, or that things were entirely lost, um, that was a piece of information that they were really glad to hear. And I did share this story of um, Celia with the, with the clinic, and uh, I was very nervous about how it would go over because, you know, it's, I was sharing with the folks who were, you know, in a way responsible for her care. And I remember thinking that I was prepared. I was like, they're going to be defensive, and I have to make sure that they realize that I am ready to feel that response. And it actually, they weren't defensive at all. You know, they recognized that these things happen. And, you know, it, it made me kind of reflect on the phenomenon of racism without racism. Like, we know that racism happens, but like, oh, I'm, I'm not racist, like, no, not me. Um, but, you know, to what degree can we know that something happens, but not be able to see it ourselves or to know when we're doing it ourselves? And I think for me, being in healthcare, I, I'm trying to, as much as I can, hold, my help, hold myself to that standard of, like, zero tolerance for percent accountability, like, you know, really taking responsibility for the things that I see that I know that can impact people like say, yeah. I know that kind of meandered a little bit away, but I hope that answered your question somewhat. <laughs> yes. How do other cities handle this? I'm thinking about New York City. I'm out of the game for 22 years, so I know nothing. But mm -hmm. uh, a place like the City Hospital, like Bellevue, yeah. used to welcome them in mm -hmm. uh, without any restriction. I don't know whether this is still true. Have you gone down there? Have you? I love that you bring up New York City as a model because I bring up New York City as a model because they actually have a <laughs> they actually have a um, basically free healthcare for um, migrants um, that is city funded. Um, and I pester New Haven folks sometimes for saying you know, and New Haven doesn't have the same kind of budgetary resources uh, that the that New York City does, but um, New Haven, uh, sorry, New York City basically has that if you seek medical care at one of these city hospitals, not any of the private hospitals, um, so not your like Cornell, um, but you know any of the city hospitals like Bellevue, um, it doesn't matter your insurance, it doesn't matter your immigration status, you can get free health care. Um, and that, I think, is a really fantastic um, option. And you know, here in New Haven, you know, Yale um, has a, like, a medical assistance program that is not advertised, but it's privately funded. And I think that there are options for better public-private partnerships um, to be able to kind of meet these needs that could be better advertised so that patients like Antonella don't you know, potentially risk dying of COVID um, because they, she can't breathe at home and doesn't want to go to the doctor because she has a bill that's outstanding. So I love that you bring up New York City as an example because it is a perfect example and it is a model that I think should be adopted more broadly. Well, to get back to New Haven, it used to be Grace New Haven, it used to be Grace Hospital, and New Haven Hospital was the free hospital. Mm -hmm. Should the city go back or Yale and Haven go back and divide itself up a little bit? Really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the answer to that, but I do think that the system does need to be reformed so that we don't have the massive inequities that we do. Um, and it's something that, you know, if you talk, this was another talking about wearing different hats, you know, when I'd be very needed, I very much have to say that I am at Yale and not of Yale because that had a different flavor when I was working with a lot of folks. 
um, and it was, you know, it, it would shut down conversations. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, people don't have the same kind of trust um, based on, you know, the experiences that they have, whether it's in, you know, in healthcare or at the university. So um, I think that it, it does merit, you know, deep reflection about how things are the way they are now, why is it the best way, and so on. Um, so I don't have the answers, but I think that there are opportunities to look at other models for, for kind of addressing the disparities that we see. Yes. What gives you hope? So I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I get a lot of hope by seeing the organizing that happens. Um, so working with folks at Unida Latina Nación and the um, Colectivo Semilla, the Semilla Collective, a lot of these women would start by getting, you know, diapers or food um, from one of these organizations and then would take that um, and become part of a mutual aid network through these organizations. And then these organizations then advocate for reforms. Like a lot of these groups are now part of the Husky for Immigrants movement that is trying to broaden healthcare access and um, Medicaid for undocumented migrants. And that really gives me hope. Um, the, I, I also say that for me, having done this research and kind of building more of the history of what Latinidad and community empowerment and economic empowerment, and I didn't get to get into all of the history of that. I was just giving a little sampler, um, but that gives me hope, and I would love to see that taught in our schools, um, that history of what, what our communities have achieved. Um, and I say this for me being a Latino woman, like to, you know, you hear all of these, you know, different stories of sure, like migration and, you know, sure, um, but you also hear all these things in the news and, you know, we, in our household, we watch a lot of Spanish news and it's things in Latin America and all the gang violence and all these things that are just really discouraging. But what if you opened a page of your textbook and it was talking about, you know, the, the move from churches to establish parish ID cards that then come to the city to get municipal ID cards? Or what if it was about kind of the whole establishment of the Puerto Rican community here in Haven and in Hartford and how, you know, the, the mass, massive collective movement to get kids to graduate from high school, like, and how you've seen, you know, the progression in education. Like that to me, to see that taught for young people would be incredibly empowering and that gives me a lot of hope. Um, so that is what I hope to see, um, you know, coming up. And I think that, you know, the legislation that passed a couple of years ago that is seeking to make um, um, Black and Latino um, ethnic studies um, part of the curriculum in Connecticut, we'll, we'll see more of this. And I know that I'm not the only scholar doing things related to this, so um, I, I find that to be very helpful and very encouraging. You yes. know, the, the largest demographic in New Haven now is not white, it's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. I think it's exciting, very exciting. And I think that's also interesting because I think that, you know, when I talk to folks, they think of New Haven as being Yale, and then I think that our black community has like its, its own kind of recognition for, you know, our, our famous history with the Black Panthers, you know, having their, their demonstrations here and um, the trials and so on. Um, and, you know, now having the very large Latinx community, I'm like, there's so much richness here. And it's very unique because there isn't just one country demographic, you know, we have so much um, representation. And the church that I mentioned, um, Santa Rosa de Lima, they used to collect really good um, demographics from their parishioners. And at one point, they had representation from every Latin American country and all of the states of Mexico. So um, that just is like really not paramount elsewhere. <laughs> I think it's very spectacular. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's something that should be featured and we should talk about and celebrate. Thank you.